What's cracking, yo? Welcome back to Boo TV. Appreciate you for stopping in. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, stay notified, and let's get into the topic for today. Bob Cousy, Bob Cousy, Bob Cousy. I'm not going to mention everybody by name, not because I don't want to, because I have failed again and remembering everybody that requested Bob Cousy, but we had quite a few of you lovely subscribers and viewers recommend Bob Cousy for me to react and look into him and his legacy as a player. And especially when I get requests about players, I'll be honest, I really don't know about, I get really excited and want to learn more. Once we start getting back that far, you know what I mean, is when my basketball knowledge uh, about the history of you know this player or that era or what basketball really was like at that time it starts deteriorating and I start to become more of a um, a basic organism than I actually am <laughs> so I was like oh Bob Cousy you know the only person I really ever hear talk about Bob Cousy is old boy on ESPN that sometimes be on first take um, Mad Dog Mad Dog always bring up Bob Cousy when talking about like all-time greats and point guards and he always be putting respect on Bob Cousy's name and also be demanding other people to put respect on Bob Cousy's name but whenever Mad Dog bring up Bob Cousy everybody just kind of be like they don't want to talk about it either because they don't know about it or they just don't appreciate it or understand it right or or want to for that matter but I'm here and I want to so like I said, I, I really don't know a whole lot about, I might as well say I know nothing about Bob Cousy. I know he's an all-time great. I know that he is widely considered the first um, superstar or all-star point guard of the NBA. I might be wrong about that. That's what I've heard. You know, AKA, what do they call him? Mr. Houdini of the Hardwood. I think this is Negr that was his name or something like that. Um, so yeah, I'll just run down, you know, his 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 accolades and some basic information about him and then I found a video that will hopefully I haven't watched the video, but the title's called Basketballography, so I'm guessing that will enlighten me on more about Bob Cousy, all right? The boy Cousy uh went to Holy Cross College. I have no idea where that's at. Was drafted in 1950 with the third overall pick in the first round. Initially selected by the Tri-City Blackhawks, but would find his way to the Boston Celtics, all right? Cousy played from 1950 to 1963 and also from 1969 to 1970. So did he... I'm guessing he retired and came back. I uh, wonder why, why he retired. That'll be interesting. I hope they tell me in the video. If not, I can look it up. Um, Kuzi was six foot one, so small point guard or that. Now, I don't know what the average height was for players way back then, but six one is small, even by today's standards for a point guard. Weighed 175 pounds. Bob Kuzi is a six-time NBA champion. I knew he was great. I didn't know he had six rings. Shit. NBA Most Valuable Player once, three time, 13 time NBA All Star, excuse me, two time NBA All Star Game MVP, 10 time All NBA First Team, two time Second Team, eight time NBA Assist Leader. On his totals, Kuzi has 16,960 points for 18.4 average for points per game, and rebounds, 4,786 total, 5.2 rebounds per game, assists, 6,955 total, 7.5 assists per Per game. So before we get in the video, I just went on ahead and looked up the retirement thing. So apparently during the 69-70 NBA season, at 41 years old, now he retired initially at age 34, but he came back at age 41. Also, the head coach for the Royals made a late season comeback as a player for seven games. So player coach, player coach for seven games. Interesting. Very interesting. All right, let's get into the uh, the video. Bob 
everybody, and welcome to NBA TV Basketballography. I'm Andre Aldrich. Today we present a man who pioneered the point guard position in the NBA. Nicknamed the Houdini of the hardwood, Bob Cousy unleashed a flashy style that was decades ahead of its time. A variety of no-look passes, spinning dishes, and behind-the-back feeds made Cousy one of the most popular players of his era. But there was plenty of substance to go along with that style. In a career that spanned from 1950 to 1963, he led the league in assists eight consecutive times and was... So just so you guys know, this is the video. You can tell the audio and video is not perfectly synced. This has nothing to do with my editing or a mistake I made. This is the uploaded video. Okay, just so you know. Consistently ranked near the top in scoring and free throw percentage. He was also a proven winner, helping to start the Boston Celtics dynasty with six titles in the late 50s and 60s. So now the story of a 13-time All-Star, a league MVP, a Hall of Famer, and one of the 50 greatest players of all time. A tale that begins, interestingly enough, across the ocean in Europe. I was fabricated overseas in France and made it like three months after the boat landed at Ellis Island. This was in 1928, not a good year. And the heart of the Depression, and we lived in this nice ghetto area on East End Avenue and well, 81st Street, Yorkville, Manhattan. Up to that point, despite, you know, b-ball being associated with NYC, I had never saw a basketball. But thank God it took my dear old dad literally 12 years to save 500 bucks and get us out of that ghetto and out to Long Island where it was a little fresh air, uh, St. Albans, where every kid in town simply wanted to play basketball for the local high school. I momentarily went out for baseball and just lost interest because my having to go to baseball practice interrupted my going to the schoolyard to play three on three. Like I said, I gave that up and we exclusively uh, played uh, b-ball. Uh, at some point during my junior year, somebody grabbed me, I don't remember who, and said, hey, kid, you know, you may have some talent. You might get a scholarship. None of us were thinking about, you know, uh, being able to go to college or afford college in those days. But this guy said, hey, you know, you're a C student. Why don't you stay awake uh, in your senior year? And, <laughs> you know, you just don't want to get a scholarship. You want to go to a good school. So I, I pretty much did that uh, and stayed awake and became a B, B plus sure. student. And uh, I was all city my last year, which for New York was kind of a big deal. I was deluged with two college offers uh, from that experience. Today, a kid making all city will have 500 coaches, college coaches sitting on his doorstep. Uh, I, we could have gone to the city schools, but I wanted to get out of the city. And so uh, ended up at Holy Cross almost, almost by mistake. I had a, a letter from the coach, Doggy Julian, saying, hey, kid, I hear you're a hot shot out there. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want a scholarship to Holy Cross, fill out this application and uh, take a train up. That was the extent of the recruiting process. Uh, I knew nothing about a similar invitation to visit from the coach at Boston College. I went up there and I looked around and said, Coach, we don't see any dorms. Where are we going to live? Where am I going to live? He said, uh, it's a day hop school. We don't have any dorms. I said, well, where? He said, well, you're going to live with a family off campus. Well, I was the original completely shy ghetto kid. The thought of living with a family for four years was terrifying. Hmm. I went, I said, Coach, thanks a lot. Got back on a train, went back to New York found Doggy Julian's letter that I had discarded. I looked at the brochure, and there were, there were dormitories at Holy Cross. I filled out the application, went there, about 10 of us meandered in the same way, and we won the NCAA our first year. Damn. Cousy went on to become a three-time All-American and one of the biggest names in the college game. As a senior, he led Holy Cross to 26 straight victories and a second-place finish in the NIT. But despite all his success, Cousy was planning for a future that didn't include basketball. I never had seen an NBA game and had no plans to. Uh, 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 my co-captain, Frank Offling, and I uh, went to see some bank presidents. We wanted to... Uh, capitalize on whatever local notoriety we had created at Holy Cross, the bank presidents we went to, 
had a thing for gas. They said, open up a string of gas stations. And so we went to, we took a crash course at Texaco. Two weeks, went out, had the biggest Texaco opening in the history of the company in that area. Uh, however, after a period of time, the word got out that it was all right for us to pump gas, but like, don't go to them for anything fancy because we, uh, we emptied the, uh, the hydromatic instead of the oil a few times and, and the word got out we want the mechanic type. But we did do something with that. We opened up an auto driving school. Within a month, we had three cars going full time around the clock. But the point is, I had no thoughts about the pros. Uh, I had just gotten married that year. We had established our home in Worcester, Massachusetts. I got a phone call in May, whatever, some newspaper man said, hey, congratulations, you're the number one pick in the country for the Tri-City Blackhawks. <laughs> and the owner was Ben Kerner. He said, what's it going to take, Coos? And I said, $10,000. Oh, my God. Oh, no, 6000 is all. I said, thanks a lot, Mr. Kerner. Shook his hand, went back to the airport, flew back, and continued teaching ladies to drive without uh, paying much attention to it at all. I uh, got a call a month later saying, by the way, they've traded you to Chicago. They eventually went bankrupt within another few weeks. Chicago, Chicago franchise, they dispersed all of the players except three of us. Uh, Max Zlowski, who had won the scoring championship the year before, an excellent guard, point guard, Andy Phillip from Illinois, and myself hadn't been dispersed. So Maurice Padaloff, the commissioner, called those three teams that hadn't gotten players down in New York. Uh, New York picked first, got Max, and they were ecstatic. They wanted a good, solid Jewish player in New York, and that's exactly what Max was. Philadelphia picked second, got Andy Phillip, and the only thing left in the hat other than the lining was moi, and uh, Boston ended up with me. and. They called me again and said, hey, you got picked out of the hat by Boston. I said, great, that's the only place I'm going to play. Drove in the next day, the owner, Walla Brown, called me and said, Bob, come in and we'd like to talk to you. Uh, I drove in and Walla said to me, what's it going to take? I said, 10000 He said, oh, geez, I can only afford nine. I said, fine. And the rest, as they say, is history. Taking a roundabout route to the NBA, Bob Cousy reported for his rookie season with the Boston Celtics in 1950. It was then that he was introduced to a fellow New Yorker who shared his no-nonsense approach to winning. An early encounter with Coach Arnold Red Auerbach showed Cousy that he wasn't in college anymore. Holy Cross had a habit, for whatever reason, our coaches made us wear T-shirts underneath our jerseys. Absorbed sweat or whatever. And I remember walking out on the floor with this T-shirt and Arnold screamed out something loving like, hey, look, what the hell are you doing with that T-shirt? Get down there and get it off. Well, I trotted back down and took the T-shirt off, came up with the jersey, and uh, that was pretty much uh, the end of any acrimony between he and I. From then on, we had a, a loving. Well, there's the master passer of them all. Red Auerbach was the mastermind behind the Boston Celtics, but he needed someone on the court to carry out his plan. A floor general with superior ball handling skill, Bob Cousy was the perfect fit. He made me captain the first year, and, uh, uh, and, and I was basically leading the, uh, you know, the offensive end of things. It goes with the position. Uh, I think I was... Uh, aware of how the game should be played on a professional level, you know, in terms of, of overall team success and what your responsibilities were. I had some very clear concepts about that, but we always, you know, Arnold was a transition coach, and uh, he had a half a dozen plays over the years, and at the end of the game, if we never called a play, he was as happy as a pig in mud, because that meant we blew their doors off, probably, because we just mm. ran their tail right off the, uh, the court. Cousy not only helped transform the Celtics into a winner, Ooh. he did it with a style okay. never before seen in the NBA. Auerbach's fast-breaking scheme allowed Cousy to create in the open floor. His right hand, left of hand. Fakes, Ooh, trick okay. Passes, and depth dribbling technique that pleased the crowd. And I've never seen that moments. layup before. Bob Cousy has dazzled Scoop two hands. Oh, he liked to go. He liked to go behind the back, don't he? 
What I was doing years ago now, every 12-year-old is doing in every schoolyard in the country and doing it better, probably okay. with more panache and, and flair than I was doing it. But I was getting all the attention in the 50s because I was the only one doing it. Okay, behind the back. I didn't work on it. I didn't practice it. It was strictly a, what's the old cliche about necessity is the mother of invention. Another great performance by Bob sees a masterpiece of twirl and overhead dexterity. I certainly was aware that I, my style of playing was attractive to fans in those days, that it was a selling tool at a time when we were trying to do everything we could to attract people in to see it, because we felt once we, as a matter of fact, that's what we used to sit around and say. Bro, these passes is dope. Bro, I like the one, I seen him do it twice, two or three times in the video already. He'll start up to shoot, it looked like he really about to shoot, and then he's like, psych. Ball behind my head, pass. <laughs> okay, Kuz, I see you, baby. You know, we've got the greatest game here. The minute Ooh. we put it in the living rooms, the minute television grabs onto it, boy, it's going to explode. The Celtics' popularity began to grow, and the team made the playoffs year after year. Kuzi was developing into a star, but the team was unable to get close to winning a championship. Unless you're going through the motions and mailing it in, which in those days didn't happen, this, this gets pretty traumatic, pretty meaningful, uh, pretty emotional. And so, as a unit, we didn't leave anything on the floor. You do this for six or seven or eight months a year. If you're never grabbing the brass ring, uh, yeah, it gets damn frustrating. Then, in 1956, Red Auerbach traded for the draft rights of a future Hall of Famer, and Celtics history would be forever changed. He told me there was a guy out in San Francisco by the name of Russell that if he could get him would change all our rebounding problems and he was going to he thought he might have a good shot at it. Uzi, waiting for his man, bounce pass to Russell. Basket is good and he's fine. When you know Russ joined the fall, we walked away saying, Wow, we knew some exciting things were gonna happen. Cozy and Russell proving an efficient combination. His animal intensity that he brought to the game, his speed and quickness in days of bigger guys, but lumbering, slow bigger guys. I mean, it was like a man playing with boys. The addition. So I, I knew, I knew him and Russell played together, but I didn't know exactly how much overlap they actually had. So I didn't know how many of those championships uh, Bob Cousy would obtain uh, during Wilt's tenure. Hmm. The addition of Bill Russell in the 1956-57 season made a good team great. Teamed with a dominant big man, Cousy raised his game to a new level, winning the NBA Most Valuable Player Award while leading the league in assists and finishing eighth in scoring. Bob Cousy, All-American from Holy Cross, Six feet one, weighing 175 pounds. Although small by pro standards, Bob is one of the all-time basketball greats. In addition to being an exceptional shooter and dribbler, Bob is an outstanding playmaker and team spark plug. Cousy and Russell made the Celtics unstoppable. Their 44 and 28 God, record was the, the best ball the handling. League, and it wasn't long before they were within striking distance of an NBA title. April 13th, 1957. After 11 years, the Boston Celtics were finally in a position to win their first NBA championship. The Celtics and the St. Louis Hawks had split the first six games of the series. Rookie of the year, Tommy Heinsohn found the range early on. High-scoring Hawk Bob Pettit drove on another Celtic rookie, Bill Russell. Russell blocked the shot, ran up court, and finished off a give-and-go by jamming the ball home. The kid from California and the gym rat from New York City made a formidable pair for the Celtics, and it was just the beginning of what was to come in Boston. With one second left, the Hawks missed two shots in close, and the buzzer sounded to end the game. Bill Russell jumped for joy, and the Celtics dynasty was born. You know, it doesn't take long for professional athletes to get overconfident or a little cocky. In our own minds, we knew we were getting pretty good, and we were going to be pretty consistent, and there wasn't anybody that could touch us in those days if we simply played up to our potential. We knew in our hearts when, when we got the strength and the power, and, and we knew how to exercise it, I think. The Celtics were just getting started. 
What followed was a period of domination not seen before or since in the history of professional sports. At Boston Garden, the final game in the hard-fought NBA championship series with 14,000 jamming the arena as the Boston Celtics, white, meet the St. Louis Hawks in dark in the final and deciding game. with the ball here plays one of the greatest games in a brilliant career oh okay then Kuzi gets the ball and connects earlier in the series he was in a slump but tonight is Bob Kuzi night as a scorer and as a playmaker the Hawks are battling valiantly to catch up but the Celtics are in unbeatable form Right down to the final tick of the clock, the Celtics dominate the play. The final score, a decisive 122 to 103. And the man of the hour is Bob Cousy. Who else? We had so much strength. You know, I mean, this is the best. Well, it's open to judgment, but it's my judgment. It's the best basketball team that's ever been assembled. I was around for six championships, 11 championships in 13 years. Can you imagine going starting the next season? You know, you've already got... 12 or 11 rings. Say, let's win it again. Basketball in Boston. It's the NBA Finals with Bill Russell, number six, brilliantly spearheading the Celtics before a capacity crowd of 14,000. The Boston quintet dazzles the St. Louis Hawks with their fast break attack. Visitors fight back to trail by only five points in the third period. Then Russell, Cousy, Heinzone, and company start clicking. This is basically your Sports Center highlight recap back then. <laughs> Playmaker Cousy, number 14, is in evidence all through the playoffs. Time running out, the Celtics have a solid lead, but they're still going. We got Kuzi was like. They clinched the series four games to one with a winning score of 121 to 112. Watch Kuzi slump exhausted as the final buzzer sounds. Twice for the all-out play that brings the Celtics their third straight title. unprecedented fifth world's championship four games to two in the series led by the remarkable bob cousy since this playoff ends bob's career as a player we like to pay him his closing tribute we know you'd like to see some highlights of his fantastic basketball wizardry cousy always a standout excelled in magic ball handling watch him when boston gets the ball take that ball down court Oof. <laughs> Watch Kuzi again, stealing and passing backwards. What a thrill he was to follow. Number 14, floor general for the world champion Celtics and a phenomenal player from his high school days on Long Island through Holy Cross and on to the pros. Despite his relatively small size in a league of very tall men, Bob could more than hold his own. Watch him go all the way right now. Robert Cousy, Mr. Basketball, the toast of Boston and millions of basketball fans everywhere. Modern players like Allen Iverson, Jason Kidd, and Steve Nash all owe a bit of their style to Bob Cousy, who redefined the point guard position. If my playmaking skills and the forerunners for what came later impacted any point guards that came afterwards, I would take great pride in the forerunner in that sense. Kuzi was such an intense competitor that he would often suffer from stomach cramps and chest pains in the locker room before games. Mm. His passion made him a natural leader. Russ and I, we didn't need any motivation. I mean, you know, we'd win a championship and come back four months later with the saliva dripping out of the corners of our mouths saying, oh, let's win it again. Kill, kill. Kuzi in the lane. Russell, dunk. Kuzi's strong mental attitude was only one of his strengths. He was also blessed with rare physical gifts that set him apart from the competition. Great peripheral vision, uh, long arms, large hands for the time. Uh, you know, I, I, these were just skills that lent itself to the position I played. 
and again, complemented by severe intensity. No, no. <laughs> Professional Houdini. athletes work their entire career sometimes to just grab the ring once. I mean, I, I hate, uh, you have to be greedy, I suppose. I, I hey, Russ, right? Russ needs another finger. He has 11. So uh, Tommy, I think, has eight. Casey has eight or nine or whatever. If you're lucky enough to, to have that kind of strength in your career, surrounded by that kind of strength in a team sport, and be as successful as we were, that's one thing. Then you get greedy and you say, boy, all I want to do is, you know, we all want to quit when we're on top, on the top of our game with a championship. I mean, I was so blessed that I was able to do all of those things. And it enriches the memories, obviously, that, that you have. It's always a hell of a lot more fun reliving, you know, championship memories, obviously, than sitting there saying, man, I played for 15 years, never grabbed the ring once. In this tribute to this immortal basketball player, one can never forget what a team player he was, how important he was in the clutch, how he could save games by himself. This is Bob staving off the clock and the Lakers to win another world championship. It was unique times, that, uh, and, and, and the fact that we were so successful as a unit was kind of the, you know, the cherry on top of the uh, whipped cream. All I've heard recently is how you're going to replace Bob. That's my answer. It can't be done because that's Mr. Basketball. When I look back, I just, uh, I just can't imagine anyone being as fortunate in their career uh, as I was because even going back to, I mentioned at the outset, I was fabricated in France. My father left the farm to come over here in the height of the depression. I have no idea why he did it, you know, it was not, not his nature and all. So I've had a series of good fortune attached to my life, uh, not only in terms of my basketball career, but in life in general. I, uh, you hear a lot of jocks say, man, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I, I, think, I think I literally am. It couldn't have happened better for me in terms of the career with the Celix, uh, the way it, it transpired and the way it ended. After his playing career came to an end, Cousy went on to coach at Boston College for six years before becoming head coach of the Cincinnati Royals. At age 41, he returned to the court for seven games during the 1969-70 season in an effort to spark his team and draw fans. After stepping down as a coach in 1974, he returned to Boston to become a Celtics broadcaster and later became the first Hall of Famer to be named president of that institution. That's all the time we have for today's show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on NBA TV Basketballography. I don't know if they still have this show on NBA TV. I, I, I very much doubt it. I don't watch NBA TV that often. Actually, I don't watch it at all unless there's a game on. Um, but oh, just over the years of popping in every now and then, I've never seen that on the schedule. But if they don't have anything or something similar to this, they should bring it, bring it back because I think it's very good. For their league, right, that's the NBA's channel, for their league to pay homage to the players that help put the league where it is today and help, you know, help the league grow and continue to shed some light on these guys. Uh, so I hope I hope they're still doing things like that for the for the public and, and whatnot. But yeah, man, yo, Koozie. Koozie. Koozie, I see you. Koozie, I see you. Ball handling. I, I, that's one thing I was looking for. I was like, let me see if he had a left hand back then. Yeah, he had a left hand back then, even nice left hand, because he kept doing that, that that baby hook or that sky hook, even from long distance. And his, he was banking that joint off the board at all kinds of different angles. So he definitely had a good feel feel for the game, no question about it. And he he explained himself pretty well, his stature, his skill set, um, but his passes, some wicked passing, man. Some wicked passing. And then he even threw one of those behind-the-back passes. Skipped it baseline. That ball straddled the out-of-bounds line. Hit the player. I was like, damn. Uh, but he got he got unique. So he he was really um coming in with that 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 uh, for for lack of a better word, showtime, but really stylistic kind of game that nobody had ever seen before. So I look at uh 
I look at uh, you know other players that kind of and, and, you know he mentioned Allen Iverson. I was gonna mention Allen Iverson too, like literally right before he said it. That's why I, I was like, All right, I ain't gonna say anything because um, they already mentioned AI, yo, Steve Nash, Jason Kidd, you know what I'm saying, and plenty, plenty, plenty of others. But yeah, Bob Cousy, the Houdini of the hard wood, guy was a beast. Six championships. I wonder if he ever feels like, man, I shouldn't have retired at 34. I think that's what his age was, 34. Probably should have stuck around a couple more years, get a couple more championships. But, you know, he's, he's probably done. He's probably done. Hell of a dynasty, though. Hell of a player. The floor general. The floor general. Kuzi and Russell and, and the gang out there dominating. Yo, he. i never seen anybody do that. He come up. Dribble right hand, dribble left hand, switch behind the back, wrap the ball, then come up two-handed layup. I was like, what? Well, I ain't never seen that. That's new-new. That's old-old, but new-new. <laughs> he said left hand, right hand, or two-handed. What's up? What's up? Cool, man. That's awesome. I might check out some more videos of uh, Bob Cousy here this year, some more highlight videos, but I needed this information because like I said I didn't I didn't really didn't know much about the guy's history or much about him at all outside of some very basic stuff I've heard through the grapevines over, over the years of being a basketball fan but pay homage man pay homage an all-time great player and a pioneer facts y'all let me know what you think about it are you a Bob Cousy fan it's Bob Cousy in your top 10 um let me see yeah, he's still alive today, actually. Bob Cousy's still alive. Did you guys ever get a chance to watch this guy play live? And one thing I also like, I'll just throw this in there. Doesn't have doesn't have anything to do with Cousy, but the time. I just love, one reason I love watching old basketball footage, like pretty much anything from mm, 2000 and three, maybe 2004, maybe 2005 and back is that cell phones really weren't as big of a thing back then. 2005 they were, so maybe like 2000, 2002, 2003 and back. And cell phones really weren't a thing, right? So when you look in the crowd, everybody is completely 100%, you know, absolved inside the game of basketball. Everybody, they're, all their attention is on the game. They are engaged. It's not like that anymore, man. It's so much different. Like I go to basketball, get a little, Back when I was in the USA, I'd go to basketball games all the time. Actually, one of my things on my bucket list is I want to go to every NBA arena and watch that team play. And I'm off to a pretty good start so far. But there's just so many people, like, either they're just sitting there. And I get it. You could take pictures and videos. But, man, some people who record the whole damn game on their phone. Or they're just texting and doing other stuff. I was like, man, you pay money to, to sit on your phone and text, bro? Come on, man. Get into the game, man. That's why we're here. Put the phone away. What's an emergency? But, uh, I mean, I, I take small video clips, a couple pictures here and there. But, you know, it's, I'm not glued to my phone during a basketball game at all. I'm not texting anybody or anything like that. But a different, different world we live in today. But I, I like watching old footage just to see how engaged the crowd is and everybody's on the same accord. All right? Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, stay notified. And I'll catch you on the next one. We out, baby.